get started, um, thank you for joining me here today. Uh, my name is Scott Linscom, and I'm the Director of General Economics and Trade here at the Cato Institute. Uh, today we're going to talk about the economic, geopolitical, and moral cases for free trade in the United States. Uh, something that wasn't nearly as controversial a couple de decades ago when I first was working the microphones in the audience as a Cato intern, uh, but has uh, certainly become more controversial in, in recent years. Um, yet, as we explain in our, our new paper, the copies of which are outside, um, on the updated case for free trade, uh, along with this beautiful e-publication that our uh, tech wizards at Cato have come up with. Um, also, I'd like to thank Alfredo Correa Obregon, my co-author on this, uh, for his uh, really amazing work. Um, but as we explain in this project, um, the case for free trade really shouldn't be that controversial, um, yet it, it is. And so today, I and my guests will discuss why uh, the case for free trade remains so strong, uh, and then we're going to take your questions uh, and wrap up uh, for lunch. Now, um, for all of those watching online, uh, you can submit your questions too, either via the online form uh, at the Cato site or by submitting via Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube using the hashtag Cato Trade, all one word, hashtag Cato Trade. We are um, very hip and with the technology. Um, so let's start with the guests. Um, first, let me start with John Gold who's already seated here to my left. John is a Vice President of Supply Chain and Customs Policy at the National Retail Federation. Uh, he's NRF's primary spokesman on supply chains, international trade, product safety, and customs-related issues. As you can imagine, he's been very busy over the last couple of years, um, at anything affecting the retail industry. Um, while at NRF, uh, John has been a leading voice in support of free trade and on the importance of global value chains for the U.S. economy. Uh, John also currently serves on the Department of Commerce's Advisory Committee on Supply Chain Competitiveness and is a spokesperson for a new group, the Americans for Free Trade. So obviously, an event on free trade, we great to have John here commenting. Um, and he'll be providing comment commentary throughout today's discussion. Um, I'm also thrilled now to introduce Senator Pat Toomey, who began representing Pennsylvania in the Senate in 2011, having previously served in the U.S. House of Representatives for six years, departing that post only because he pledged to limit himself for three terms. It's always the good ones that pledge to limit themselves. Uh, since, the late teen, since the late 1990s, Senator Toomey has been elected and re-elected on a platform of economic growth, free markets, and fiscal responsibility. We like all those things here at Cato. While in Congress, he's successfully led efforts to cut taxes for families, make our business tax code more competitive, and end wasteful federal spending. Most notable for today's purposes, however, is that Senator Toomey has been a strong and unwavering champion for free trade during his time in Congress. His record in the House and then in the Senate reflects consistently strong support for open markets and international engagement. Now, back in the good old days, when there was bipartisan political consensus for liberalizing trade, Senator Toomey supported some of the easy stuff, like free trade agreements and the rest, but also some politically difficult things, um, permanent normal trade relations for China in 2000, for example, uh, eliminating or scaling back uh, sugar quotas um, or wool and mohair products, uh, taking on uh, targeted special interests. He's still fighting big sugar, I should note, uh, with a recent legislation sponsored in uh, 2021 to try to scale back or at least improve that program. Um, but even as the tide here in D.C. and even in the Republican Party shifted against trade a bit a few years ago, Senator Toomey remained one of the most vocal and unwavering proponents of free trade in Congress. Most notably, he was one of the few voices of congressional sanity in voting against President Trump's NAFTA replacement, the uh, inartfully named U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, because of its protectionist elements. He even wrote a Wall Street Journal op-ed explaining his vote and spoke against it in the Senate with a sweet chart behind him saying NAFTA greater than USMCA. It's excellent visual. Senator Toomey also frequently voiced opposition to President Trump's tariffs on steel and aluminum and on Chinese imports and proposed legislation to rein in executive trade powers and provide U.S. importers with tariff relief. Now, for us at Cato, these actions were obviously welcome and impressive, but they were made even more impressive by the fact that the senator was not only opposing the trade-skeptical president and leader of his own party, 
but doing so while hailing from Pennsylvania, both a major swing state and the very home of US Steel. Now, being frequently quoted in Pittsburgh media for opposing steel tariffs uh, is kind of like a congressman from my current home state of North Carolina publicly opposing pork barbecue. Very, very controversial, and yet he took the principled stand. Like I said, the political easy thing to do would have been to support the tariffs and Trump's trade agreement. But not, not only did Senator Toomey oppose this protectionism, he actively sought to curtail the very powers that allowed the president to impose the tariffs in the first place. This, that this display of political courage and principle, rare in Washington nowadays, unfortunately, that this didn't receive more attention and praise is astounding and, quite frankly, sort of depressing. Uh, but I digress. Senator Toomey's record and public statements in support of free trade show a nuanced understanding of trade policy and how it benefits the US and global economies, as well as Americans' daily lives. They show an understanding of the geopolitical benefits of free trade and the harms of imposing tariffs on our closest commercial partners and strategic allies. And they show an understanding of the costs and failures of American protectionism, as well as of Congress's constitutional role in crafting and executing US trade policy. Now, if this all sounds familiar, it should. Those points are all core pillars of our new Cato project on the updated case for free trade. And so that's why, obviously, we're here today, to recognize Senator Toomey's legacy and to discuss with him as he prepares to leave con Congress why those who remain on the Hill and those who follow him should advocate and strive for freer trade. So with that, please join me in welcoming to the Cato Institute, hopefully not for the last time, Senator Pat Toomey. Thank you very much, Scott. That was a very kind introduction. Thank you very much for that. Thanks to all of you. Thanks for having me here today. It's great to be back at Cato and uh, sharing some time with uh, like-minded folks. Uh, the uh, folks at the table that I sat at observed this was probably going to be a friendly audience for my message, and uh, I appreciate that. Scott and Alfredo, let me compliment you on your essay. I thought it was terrific. I have read it, and it was very... Uh, uh, of course, I agree with the substance of it, but, but importantly, from my point of view, I thought it was also particularly persuasive, and that's part of what we need to be doing here. Uh, John, thank you for all your work, including your very valuable work in helping us with our legis a recent legislative project to ensure that companies would have an opportunity to get an exclusion from the 301 tariffs uh, to which they are subject, so thanks for all that. Um, it seems to me there, there are few areas of policy where the moral and economically correct prescription is as clear as it is for free trade. And that's for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is trade is throw some gain. The unrestricted mutual exchange of goods and services benefits both the parties involved. How do we know that? Because in a free society, the transaction wouldn't occur unless it were beneficial. And my mic seems to be going in and out, but maybe people can hear me without it. Um, you know, one of the things that's always struck me as um, ironic and frustrating in the case for trade is that uh, nobody thinks about trade across borders when the arbitrary political happens to separate, say, two states within the Union. I've been representing 12 years, and no one has ever once asked me, what am I doing about the trade deficit that Pennsylvania has with New Jersey? I don't actually know whether Pennsylvania has a trade deficit with New Jersey, and I don't think anyone else knows, because nobody cares. It would be ridiculous to obsess about something like that, but since it's a national boundary, Suddenly, we think that if there's a trade deficit, there must be some economic catastrophe. This makes no logical sense, but yet it is a prevalent notion. Um, protectionist policies and all their various permutations interfere with one of the most natural human activities, which is an exchange of goods and services, an exchange of our productive capabilities. And so it's, it's objectionable to our, our very nature, I think, it also creates distortions and it showers rents on the few 
beneficiaries of whatever protectionist policy we're talking about. Plus, it can be very challenging politically, and I think the central reason why this is politically challenging is that of protectionism tend to be concentrated, and when they're concentrated, they are very visible, and, and of course, they are vigorously defended by those who are getting them, and the benefits are often widely distributed, like the fact that consumers get lower prices. It's much hard, harder to to visualize that, to quantify that, to see that, and for that to have an impact. Despite all that, no, oh, I, I should say that this dynamic, right, of, of concentrated benefits for the protectionists and, and distributed benefits for, in free trade is why one former U.S. voting to lower trade barriers and, quote, an unnatural act for a policy. Despite that, for many decades after World War II, really for, for almost 100 years now, American policymakers as a whole did a pretty good job committing these unnatural acts. America became the global champion for trade liberalization to the enormous benefit of American workers, consumers, and businesses. In 1947, the U.S. helped found the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, GATT, trade agreement whose purpose was, according to its preamble, the substantial reduction of barriers and the elimination of preferences on a reciprocal and mutually beneficial basis. Yet enshrined the core principle of most favored nation status, the idea that countries should apply the same tariff to all other members. And in the 1990s, the U.S. then charged to form the WTO, the World Trade Organization. 164 member countries. It's by far the largest trade agreement in history. And then, of course, the U.S. also negotiated free trade agreements with our allies, including the really monumental North America Free Trade Agreement. According to the Peterson Institute, between 1950 and 2016, the payoff to Americans from the expansion of trade and the liberalization of trade resulted directly in a GDP per capita increase of over $7,000 in 2016, constant dollars. Money. It changed people's lives. It lifted people out of poverty. It created a higher standard of living. It did all those things. Now, on the political side, until 2016, prior to 2016, benefit or trade were almost always largely recognized by American presidents. They were advocates for expanding trade, whichever party they happen to be from, as a general. My concern is that understanding is, uh, seems to be eroding, and we might be entering an era, a, a new era of, of protectionism. So as today's event title suggests, we're having an alarming uh, risk to the bipartisan, what had been a bipartisan consensus for trade in Washington, at least at the level of the President and in the Senate. Um, <clears throat> so we see this in various uh, manifestations, right? The assertion that national security is economic security, and that becomes the justification for tariffs on things like steel and aluminum and autos. Calls to this will somehow strengthen them. All kinds of even when they mean hurting American manufacturers and lower income consumers, especially. The U.S. trade rep now has this vaguely and deceptively branded, quote, worker centric trade, which is really meant to diminish free trade. And then, of course, there's that protectionist cult, the so called fair trade. Noticeably absent from the debate on trade policy this, these days, too often is any consensus in favor of purely free trade. As Scott pointed out, this was once a relatively non-controversial idea, especially among most Republicans. It is now treated as a minority view. Only Republicans in order to vote against USMCA, despite the fact that that agreement was explicitly intended to restrict trade. It was designed to take a free trade and, uh, agreement and curtail 
the opportunity for free trade. I thought that was a pretty good reason to oppose it. I had others, but that was the main one. And, and because I have this radical view that we ought to be free to exchange goods and services with other people, um, a certain former president nicknamed me Pat No Tariffs to Me, <laughs> which I'm pretty sure he intended as an insult. <laughs> and I took as a great compliment. <laughs> um, but I think there's a danger that this anti-trade uh, atmosphere is more than just a blip on the political radar. Now, here's this, this surprised me. The Biden administration has decided that they will carry the Trump torch on protectionism. The, all the misguided policies in this space, the Biden administration is perpetuating. I had thought that we might get a break from Trump policies, and in some respects, we, in some area, other areas we have, but not on trade. The uh, Biden administration has vigorously opposed attempts to secure even mere tariff exemptions for American importers of Chinese products, for instance, even when the American importer has no alternative anywhere in the world than the Chinese source. Still, the administration doesn't want them to get an exemption from the tariff. Or take the fact that we've still made no progress on reforming these so-called national security tariffs, despite the fact that they were imposed under clearly flagrant abuse of the statute. Then there's the fact that, to this day, they have failed to initiate negotiations with, on any new free trade agreement anywhere in the world, including with allies, including obvious opportunities like the UK, Taiwan, Kenya, all opportunities to have terrific expansion of trade, mutual trade opportunities, no progress whatsoever. So the fact is we've lost our way on trade. America is not playing the leadership role that we have played historically that we should be playing. I, I, I'm reminded of a speech in November of 1988 in his final radio broadcast from the Reagan ranch. President Reagan reiterated his support for free trade and his opposition to protectionism. Now, just two months prior, Congress had, with an overwhelming majority, passed the implementing legislation for the historic free trade agreement between the U.S. and Canada. But at this moment, at the time of Reagan's broadcast, the U.S. was still waiting for Canada to go through its internal ratification process. Here's what Ronald Reagan said. Our peaceful trading partners are not our enemies. They're our allies. We should beware of the demagogues who are ready to declare a tra trade war against our friends, weakening our economy, our national security, and the entire free world, all while cynically waving the American flag. Can you imagine the current president saying that? I don't, I don't think so. For the next month, the Canadian Parliament approved the agreement, ensuring its entry into force in January of 1989. Just a few years later, the U.S.-Canada Pact became the foundation for what was, at the time, the largest free trade agreement in history. It was NAFTA. Subsequent presidents generally concluding FTAs with 17 additional countries. U.S. leadership would do well to remember and to re-embrace the free trade that once was a priority for previous administrations. We should also remember the moral superiority of freedom, very much including the freedom of voluntary exchange. It doesn't end simply because there's a border between two societies. Free trade is a natural, it is, it is natural, it is just, and it makes us all more prosperous. So thank you for all that you do to advance this really important cause. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Senator. Um, excellent remarks. Um, now, <clears throat> let's get into the questions. Again, uh, for those watching online, uh, please submit your questions via the form or uh, via comments at Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube using the hashtag CatoTrade. Uh, now, Senator, uh, as I noted in my introduction and, and uh, as you've noted in your remarks, you've been a staunch supporter of free trade throughout your career in Congress, even after trade skepticism invaded Congress and a certain openly protectionist Republican president carried your state in 2016. Now, our project, 
on the updated case for free trade provides a laundry list of economic, geopolitical, and moral reasons to support free trade and oppose protectionism. And you've provided, I think, a, a, a short outline of some of your views. But I wanted to dig into this a little bit more and see why you personally support free trade and uh, what you would think is maybe your, your, your m biggest reason for doing so. Sure. Um, let me point out, in 2016, I carried Pennsylvania by a bigger margin than Trump did, just for the record. <laughs> just, um, he's he's uh, taking credit for my win. I'm skeptical <laughs> about that. Um, look, so I think of it in two, two categories, I, and I always have, right? There is, a, for me, an important moral consideration. So it, it depends, I guess, on the, your hierarchy of political values. For me, freedom is at the top. And personal freedom has to include the ability to engage in an exchange of goods and services, whether it's with your neighbor or whether it's with somebody who's not your neighbor and lives far away. What difference does that make? So it's so fundamental to human nature is the ability to own your own production, you know, you, you, you uh, have, uh, have that claim on, on your time if you're a free person, and so you have to have the ability to, to purchase and sell. It's an integral part of personal freedom, and that's always been important to me. But the other thing that I think is very important, too, is just as a practical matter, it, it is what enables uh, the division of labor and specialization and all the efficiencies that come with that, and so you have more prosperity. And so freer trading societies are more prosperous societies. When, when the world, uh, you know, arguably, despite Trump's moving, uh, moving us backwards, he didn't move us that far. And, and so we're still in one of the freest trading environments in the last hundred years. And it's no coincidence that this has been the environment in which literally billions of people have been lifted out of poverty and the standard of living has improved at an accelerating pace. So I think it's both a very compelling moral and a very compelling practical case. That's, that's why I feel strongly about it. Yeah, it's great. It's great to hear the moral, uh, the moral argument. That's something that we wrote about in our paper, and it's something that I don't think free traders really uh, talk enough about. Um, and quite frankly, the immorality of the alternative, of protectionism, of, of taking someone's property and giving it to someone else uh, merely for uh, political consideration. Now, John, uh, you're on the ground, um, so I, care to comment? Sure. First of all, Scott, great job on, on the paper. I think you guys really laid out fantastic arguments on you know why trade is so important, why it still remains so important. And obviously, Senator Toomey, you know, all of your great work over the years, you know, we applaud you for, for your willingness to stand up and tell the story of why trade is important for importers, exporters, manufacturers, and for workers, which I think is the part that continues to be missed. Right. And for, you know, for my members, you know, National Retail Federation, the world's largest retail trade association, represent everybody from these small single store operators to large foreign big box stores, online, chain restaurants, everybody in between, trade is our lifeblood. If we're not able to get sourced goods that the consumers want from around the globe, high quality products at affordable prices, our folks are gonna go out of business. So it's the ability to have that open and fair trade or free trade to be able to get goods for those consumers. But the other part of it too is that while retailers might not make products, many of our members do, they make markets. They make it the ability for a retailer to go and open up a store overseas and bring US products over there and bring, open up those markets where you might not have those other opportunities. So as we're talking about IPEF and other, other trade projects that are going forwards, to not have market access as a part of that is a significant problem. So if we're looking at how do we improve the job market and get more exports to go overseas, having the ability to open up those markets is, is significant. And then the other part of it too is, I mean, we've been doing this for so long, we've got to get away from imports bad, exports good. I think imports and exports are just as important to each other. Imports help drive exports. And oh, by the way, we represent you know, 52 million working Americans, one in four US jobs. Millions of those jobs are dependent upon trade, yep. whether it's sourcing, design, finance, customs, transportation, logistics. All these different jobs are part of the supply chains which are so critical right now. So we've got to talk about the importance of imports and exports equally. And I think that's what continues to get lost is folks don't realize the importance of exports or imports, it's not just the finished goods we're talking about, but it's those inputs to production, those intermediate goods, which unfortunately have been hit the hardest as a result of the Trump tariffs. So I think that's why we are so strongly you know, supportive of free trade and support what you know, Senator Toomey's been doing over the years. If I can just add, 
I mean, this is such a good point, the importance of imports. Well, the purpose of exports is to import. Right? I mean, the purpose of production is consumption. Why, why do people go to work every day? It's so that they have the ability to consume the things that they want to consume. Um, and we, we talk about it the exact opposite, and that's ridiculous. We should, we should remind folks of how, how important imports are. Yeah, and uh, two stats that we throw around a lot and we've mentioned in the paper. Um, one, kind of a classic one, is that uh, few people know that about half of everything we import is capital goods and equipment used by manufacturers to make other stuff. Um, so that shows kind of the necessity of trade for manufacturers, not just to export Boeings overseas or whatever, but to have access to those global supplies um, and why things like steel tariffs are so, uh, quite frankly, idiotic. Uh, it really hurts those manufacturers that, can, that, that need those supplies. The other stat that, that's actually newer that I just love is a new study came out earlier this year um, showing that uh, goods traders defined broadly in the retail space or in manufacturers that import and export. Goods traders make up only about 6% of all companies in the United States and yet account for about half of all American jobs. After the Great Recession, goods traders were accounted for 60% of net new jobs in the United States since about 2008. And it shows the, the integral nature of these companies and of trade in, in in their operations, which again is, is very pro-worker. We have that worker-centric trade policy that pretty, sounds pretty pro-worker to me. Um, so let's, let's uh, keep moving on. Um, so Senator, in our, in our new project, um, we note that while overall public support for free trade actually remains pretty high, contrary to I think some of the conventional wisdom out there, um, and remains high even amidst the COVID-19 pandemic and all the supply chain crisis, chaos that, that John knows so well. Um, the long-standing bipartisan political consensus has really unraveled in Washington. Trade really is a now four-letter word a couple blocks away. Um, when it comes to tariffs, industrial policy, Buy America mandates, and economic nationalism more generally, um, as you know, our current president sure sounds a lot like our previous president, albeit, albeit probably a little more polite about it. Um, and this persists even as we see, I think, almost daily new evidence of the benefits of globalization, say, for example, the, the Pfizer vaccine, um, and the problems that protectionism and industrial planning raise. Um, things like rapid tests that we didn't have enough of earlier, or now for infant formula. You people know about 98% of all of our infant formula is, is uh, made here in the United States. But when you have a factory closure in the United States, well, what happens? You have a lot of empty shelves and frantic parents. Now, getting back to the politics, though, Senator, what, in your view, has driven the dramatic political shift over the last, say, decade or so? And I think, importantly for us today, how can free traders regain the bipartisan uh, I think a, a large part of it has been the acceleration of innovation and the impact that's had on the, our economy and on ordinary people's lives, right? Freedom is disruptive. And what we've had is this confluence of expanding trade at the same time an, ex an acceleration of technology has changed our economy, right? Um, I. Traveling around Pennsylvania, you wouldn't believe how many times people have asked me, why don't we manufacture anything in America anymore? And my head is about to explode. Because this year we'll set an all-time record for the most manufactured value ever created in American history. But we do it with fewer workers. It's more automated. It's, it's done in different industries. And with you know we make different things. So it's not as visible. But, but this disruption that has certainly occurred and accelerated in recent decades has often, it's been blamed on trade. Now, trade's contributed to it, right? The, the trade has been part of it. I, I think that disruption is very uncomfortable for a lot of people, um, and it's often for understandable reasons. If, if you have been uh, doing a particular job for a long time, and that's the only skill that you've ever been able to really uh, get paid to, to, to engage in, if that goes away, that's a real problem. And um, 
I think automation has done that more than anything else probably, but trade has contributed. And so, so that, that's created a fertile ground for people who want to advance a protectionist message. And they've been able to do so. I, I think what we've got to do is remind people about the benefits, focus on the importance of imports as well as exports, focus on the, uh, the fact, as it happens, that export-related jobs tend to pay more than non-export related jobs. Focus on the elevation of the standard of living. I mean, the fact is, the vast majority of us live better than our parents. And almost all of us live better than our grandparents. Even if we, if, if unlike me, if, if you actually come from a wealthy family, it's still the case because the things that we have and take for granted today that didn't exist when our grandparents uh, were growing up and, and were, um, were living. Um, so. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing challenge, it's going to be, um, but we've, we've got to stay at it. Finally, on a, a you know, purely political level, I think it does take presidential leadership. It's, it's, hard to, uh, it's hard to substitute for an American president who's willing to stand up and make the case and pursue expanding trade. Yeah, we found in um, previous work at Cato that uh, the American public's views on trade and protectionism shift pretty dramatically depending on what the president's saying. There's, because let's face it, we, a lot of us don't have trade in our daily lives. We don't really think about all the wonders that trade brings us, that John's member companies bring us. Um, and so if the president is, is a pro-trade, the polls go up. If the president is protectionist, the, the polls go down. So there's, I think you're, that's a, a huge point for sure. Now, John, you, uh, being on the ground, kind of seeing this firsthand, uh, well, how, do, how do you view this issue? Yeah, I mean, I think Senator Toomey is exactly right. I mean, I think, you know, we've been working, I've been working in this for, you know, 20 plus years now, and it's always easy to use trade as a scapegoat for why we have job losses. When again, you know, manufacturing has been up year over year because we're becoming more productive, more efficient in what we do. We're able to make more because of innovation, because of automation, because of technology, not necessarily because of trade. And trade creates new jobs, new opportunities for that innovation and that, that advancement. So I think we've got to do a better job talking about the jobs that are dependent upon trade, that folks might not see. You might not realize that what you're doing is trade dependent. Your job depends on the ability to export, the ability to import. So I think we've got to do a better job across the board of talking about all those jobs associated with, with trade, why the global value chain is so important, all the jobs associated with the global value chain. Um, you know, while things might be made overseas, technically you know, put together, the research and design happens here in the U.S. But how many people think about the importance of research and design when it comes to trade? Those jobs are uncounted when you talk about jobs related to trade. So I think we've got to kind of change that dynamic a little bit to talk about that. And I completely agree with, with Senator, your comments about the need for leadership on trade coming from the top. I mean, obviously, we witness, you know, previous president talking about how negative trade was, how bad a trade deficit is. And oh, by the way, you know, China's paying the tariffs. No, China didn't pay the tariffs. It's everybody here in the room who pays the tariff as a tax when you go in and shop. So I think that's what we need to, you know, have that leadership from the top talking about the benefits of trade, and that's how we change the dynamic of imports bad, exports good. We've got to have that leadership from all of our elected officials talking about the value of trade and why it, why it applies to everybody and the importance of it going forward. And so I think that's kind of where we need to really focus. And it's just, it's been a challenge. You know, again, the past 20 years I've been working on this. Um, but we've got to find a better, better way to describe that. And, and do you find that the personalization of the trade message, you know, talking about specific member companies, specific small businesses, you know, Etsy earning moms at home, that kind of thing, does, does that help? I think it does. And I think it's incumbent upon those companies to explain to their employees why trade is important for them, for their company. And oh, by the way, as a worker, you're a consumer who benefits from trade as well. So I think it starts with, you know, corporate America telling their, you know, their workers, you know, why trade is so valuable to them. I know we've tried these campaigns in the past. Yeah. Um, but it's important to continue that messaging. So finally, um, my final question, then we'll open it up again to the audience. Um, so there's been a lot of ink spilled about the economic and geopolitical effects of the last few years of U.S. tariff adventurism. I'll, it's a euphemism for sure. But much less discussed is why the president could impose all those tariffs in the first place, basically with no say by Congress. Some sternly worded letters, but that's about it, right? In particular, 
you know, I think few people seem to understand that Congress actually has constitutional authority over tariff policy. It's right there in Article I, Section 8. Um, and yet Congress has delegated massive swaths of that power to the president via all sorts of vague open-ended trade laws like Section 232 or Section 301 and U.S. trade remedies laws like our anti-dumping and countervailing duties laws. And these laws that were probably well intended at the time they were implemented, but were used, and I'd, we'd say it Cato abused by President Trump to impose tariffs on not just metals and Chinese imports, but also solar panels and washing machines. Just this week, we had more news about the tumult that solar panels tariffs, of course, are causing right now. Um, and President Trump used those, those powers to threaten other tariffs. Um, who can forget uh, we were going to put tariffs on cars? for national security reasons at one point. Um, now, we at Cato have written two papers on this, uh, one on Section 232 that was out a couple months ago, one on Section 301 reform, which will actually be out next week. Got to get that plug in. Um, and on why these laws need to be reformed. Um, and I know you, Senator, have championed various fixes as well. So why do you think that these decades-old laws need to be changed? And for the fun part, if you could snap your fingers and implement only one reform magically, King for a moment, uh, what would it be? That would be, that's a tough one. But um, so uh, the uh, there's been a, a very disturbing trend for decades of Congress just abrogating its responsibility and turning over authority and responsibility that the Constitution assigns to Congress to the executive branch, and this is a very bad development for our for our. I think, right? Uh, there's a reason that our founders made Article I all about Congress. And there's a reason that they specified the responsibilities that Congress had, and as you correctly point out, trade is among them. Now, I think you could make a case that there's certain circumstances where a delegation makes some sense. For instance, if you're going to negotiate a free trade agreement, it's probably hard for 535 members of Congress to negotiate the terms of a free trade agreement with some other country. Okay. So with very clearly defined parameters, you could delegate that negotiating authority to the president and retain for Congress the final decision as to whether to approve or to reject. TPA is meant to provide that kind of mechanism. But why not do that on 232 tariffs? If you really think that Toyotas are a threat to our national security, okay. Make the case to the American people that, you, that we need to put tariffs on them. We, we need to tax American consumers when they choose to buy a Toyota. Make that case, and then let's have an up or down vote so that Congress will be accountable for it. That's what my 232 legislation does. It says if a, a president wants to invoke 232 on national security grounds, okay, he can make the case, but it doesn't happen until Congress decides that that's appropriate. That's what the Constitution calls for, if you ask me. This, this, of course, is very controversial because all the protectionists, they like it the way it is. They like it because they figure all tariffs are good, right? The more, the merrier. And so why would you constrain the president's ability to slap tariffs for whatever illegitimate reason? That's a pretty poor <laughs> justification, but that's a big part of it. And then you've got folks who, in, in Congress, just don't want to get crosswise with the president of their party. So even if they're not thrilled with what he's doing, they don't necessarily want to be on record voting against him. That being said, we have made some progress. Mark Warner is my Democrat co-sponsor. To his credit, he, re he renewed his support for the legislation despite the fact that there's a president of his party in office. We have a significant a good number of uh, senators on the Finance Committee, which is the Committee of Jurisdiction, so I guess I'd have to say, given all the work we've done on, on this, if I, could, if I could have that wand, that magic wand, I would, uh, I would implement our, our law uh, restoring Congress's responsibility on 232 tariffs. Yeah, I heard um, a while ago Senator Lee, one of your colleagues who's also championed these types of reforms, mentioned, he said, you know, in the law right now, you need a congressional up or down vote to liberalize tariffs via trade agreements, but you don't need that same approval for 232 or Section 301, it just happens. And that imbalance alone would seem to, <laughs> to, to argue for, for having, having a check. For Who would sure. think? Uh, now, John, the other thing, though, that, that I think the delegation of all these congressional trade powers has, has 
caused, and the economic studies show this, is a tremendous amount of uncertainty in the US economy, right? You know, uh, trade policy by tweet, not exactly great for, again, small retailers that have shipments on the water. So for you, John, um, this delegation, how has it affected the retail industry and, and your member companies, and, and um, how, do we, how do we claw it back? Yeah, I mean, I think that uncertainty certainly has been, been a challenge. You know, when we look at our trade laws, it's never taken into consideration the impact on the downstream industries, those that rely on the trade. You know, it's always brought forward by whoever brings the case and that, that one importer or the exporter overseas. But we don't talk about the impact on all those who depend on those goods that are coming in. So that uncertainty certainly has a significant impact. And we look at, you know, the last administration, the, the threat of tariff by tweet. You know, we put the 301 tariffs on China. Folks tried to ship to Vietnam. Guess who was the next target? We might put tariffs on Vietnam. What? Wait, that's where you told me to go to. Why are you going to put tariffs on Vietnam? Now what am I supposed to do? So it's that uncertainty that continues to, to provide frustration. And even just the announcement of a potential tariff throws markets into disruption. I mean, look at the solar issue on its, on its face. The fact that they started bringing a case forwards and the impact it's had on the market, and yet we, now we have you know, a two-year delay on that case, you know, will that market come back or not? I don't know. Because you still have two years. What happens later? So I think that uncertainty is a significant challenge. So I think you know, bringing it back to Congress to have the ultimate say on, let's be honest, tax policy, which is what right. this is, is incredibly important. Yeah, sometimes slower is actually better right. when it comes to this stuff. Like sure. Let's actually evaluate what's actually going to happen at the end of the day and understand from all the stakeholders what's actually at stake here. You know, is it protecting one industry that might benefit from this? And will they actually benefit? Will they create jobs? You know, is that going to happen or not? What about all those jobs that are going to be lost because of the tariffs that are being put in place and being considered? I think that's what we need to talk about. I think that's where Congress has the ultimate role to make that decision. Well, with that, um, we'd like to open it up to questions to the audience. And again, for those watching online, uh, you can submit your questions uh, via the online form at the website or on Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube via uh, the Cato Trade hashtag. Um, sure. Uh, yeah, th sorry. Uh, they'll be bringing a mic around for you. I'm uh, Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. I'm concerned a little bit about um, the concept that free trade uh, is it runs up against national security at times. My concern in particular is when foreign manufacturers, often allies, are producing things that are a little better, occasionally a lot better, than by America. And so I'm wondering, uh, Senator, how you, in your mind, balance those national security concerns of uh, free trade, meritocracy, best stuff rises to the top, versus having to buy American, even though it might not be the state of the art. The, uh, I think the, the category in which we, we could have and, and should have a, a, a discussion about limiting trade is with hostile countries. Um, you know, if you witness what's happening in Europe right now, the Western European countries, Germany especially, a few others, are buying huge amounts of natural gas from Russia. They've become completely dependent on it. And that money is subsidizing a, an appalling war on their neighbor. And frankly, if Putin were to be successful in Ukraine, which I don't think he will be, but if he were to be, um, Ukraine wouldn't be the last country that would be uh, in his... Uh, in his targets. So does it really make sense for Germany? We, we don't buy much of anything, really, from Russia. Um, but does it really make sense for Germany to be in this position of dependency on Russia for something as fundamentally important as natural gas? I don't think so. And uh, you know, I, I would say there's an example of a country that shouldn't be abandoning its nuclear power, <laughs> which is like crazy that they're doing that and ought to be looking for ways to import natural gas from other places, including the United States, by the way. We could easily replace all of the uh, Russian sales, not overnight, but pretty quickly, if we had the uh, infrastructure to do it. 
and I would just I would add quickly um, that you know there are some really obvious connections between trade and national security right now on the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, for example, which is intended to counterbalance China, bolster U.S. national security, but of course it omits trade, which is really crazy, right, that, that there are these linkages that are necessary. Studies show that this, you know, trade actually reduces the chances of armed conflict, can bolster our ability to have strategic supplies in times of need, and yet, you know, we're not out there doing those kind of right. obvious right. things to improve. Yeah, it's, it's clear, I mean, it's pretty clear the Chinese would like to have a trading block of countries that are really dependent on trade with China. And they'll develop all kinds of systems and protocols and standards and methodologies that will lock that in to the maximum extent they can. Most of those countries would frankly rather have that relationship with the United States. And there's the opportunity. So uh, I, I've been having this argument with the administration, with anyone who will listen, that engaging these other countries, including on trade, is the huge opportunity for us to you know, take advantage of the fact that, I mean, if you're Vietnam, frankly, you'd rather have this kind of relationship with the United States than with China, um, but yeah. to no avail so And far. these diplomats are openly begging for us to, totally. to include trade. Uh, New totally. Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern was just here yeah. saying as much. You know, we got to get back, get back in the game. It's certainly frustrating. Right. Um, questions? Why don't we put it right there? Uh, Jacob Atkinson, a uh, partner at United Western uh, Private Equity Group. Uh, could you touch on um, a little bit what you talked about with technology and automation specifically uh, in regards to trade and any potential downside with job loss to that and, and potential tax? I know sometimes it's thrown around with uh, how automation could affect jobs and how those jobs will be replaced, specifically in the manufacturing industry. For me, yeah. Um, well, I, well, let me let me put it this way. Um, there's there's right like econom human economics is all about becoming more efficient. It's all about the pursuit of how you can get more goods and services with less uh, human labor having to be required to do it. That's that's really. The, the really the driving force. It's completely natural. Technology is uh, a big part of the mechanism that allows that to happen. The, the wonderful thing is, while we have had this acceleration in technology and automation that comes with it, there's always been continuing demand for workers. I mean, what's the single biggest problem that, that, that business across America has right now? Inflation's a big one. But lack of workers is yeah. a bigger one. There's more job openings than there are people looking for jobs. Who would have thought 20 years ago, if someone could tell you just how much automation would occur, just how much technology would replace sort of rote manual labor, who would have thought that our biggest problem in 2022 would be lack of workers for all the job openings we have? And the jobs pay more, the, the, the standard of living improves, so the, the, the reality is, and I'll be, I admit, I get, you know, part of it is counterintuitive, right? It's, it's, it is surprising to some degree, but, that's, but it's the truth. So that, that's my view, that, you know, technology is enhancing the standard of living of American workers, and that's why we should embrace it and welcome it. Yeah, just last month, uh, the Labor Department reported that uh, we had almost one million job openings in manufacturing right now. Um, and, of course, that automation allows American companies to be more competitive versus lower wage, less productive competitors in, in other countries. So um, it's it really kind of amazing, really, with trade, right, that, that uh, and a lot of economics discussions, we still are acting like we don't have, you know, 3.5% unemployment right. and 11 million job openings, right? right. Um, but it is, of course, an important narrative to to defeat in terms, I think, of long-term trade liberalization. So this is going to be our, our last question, and I do want to take one online. I apologize to those in the audience that I didn't get to you. Um, this comes from Lauren via Facebook. Um, can you discuss the relationship between tariffs and inflation? Are you uh, encouraged by President Biden's announcement that he's going to look at the tariffs, excuse me, look at the tariffs to reduce inflation? 
Um, do you think that that should be part of the kind of inflation fighting tool book at this point? Uh, well, look, I'm in favor of lower tariffs, so that's good. And yes, on the margin, it'll lower prices, so that's good. I mean, I do think inflation tends to be more a monetary phenomenon than uh, a tariff-related phenomenon. But um, look, the, the Fed got way behind the curve. The government's been wildly overspending, right? We had, we had a, a $2 trillion hole in the economy from the lockdowns, and we filled it with $6 trillion of spending. Oh, okay. And meanwhile, the Fed is just pumping in money like never, literally never before. So yeah, we got an inflation problem. Um, I'm, I'm in favor of lower tariffs, but the real problem is getting government spending and monetary policy under control, in my view. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of issues contributing to, to inflation, but obviously we are strong supporters of lowering the tariffs, providing tariff relief, especially small, uh, you know, small importers, small retailers. That's going to help. It's a start. It's not going to solve all the issues with inflation. Labor isn't going to, you know, needs to help there. Easing the supply chain burdens that we're facing right now is a, is a big part of that. But, you know, we called upon the president several weeks ago to look at tariffs and look, we got to get beyond just looking at it. Let's do something. It's time to do something now before we get even further behind the curve than we already are to address it. He's going to establish a blue ribbon commission to uh, appoint a committee and then maybe we'll get around to looking at them. Well, listen, um, with that, we, we need to end our time. The senator gets to a, a vote. So I just want to, again, thank you very much for being here. Um, and thank you all for, for coming. Thanks, Thank you. Really thank you.